I want to say a very special thank you to Jewish Voice for Peace and for IPS. Uh, Jewish Voice for Peace uh, helped to co-sponsor this event along with the Institute of Policy Studies of which I am a uh, board member and Phyllis is a fellow. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's great to have all of you here and I want to say... So this is going to be just a very brief couple questions that I'm going to ask Phyllis and then uh, they'll be very pithy and very deep uh, as, as you would imagine. And, and then, and then once, once that's over, we're going to take a microphone around and if you have questions, we'll try to get everybody's uh, comments in or questions. All right, so, so Phyllis was interviewed this morning on Business Matters. Uh, uh, this is the show we have on WPFW with Nizam Ali and myself. And um, the first question I asked her is, why are you writing a book about an Egyptian goddess? And then she explained to me that you have it all wrong, Andy. This is ISIS. Uh, it's the different kind of ISIS. So what first, I s first, I said that I really love that Egyptian goddess, if you recall. <laughs> yes, you did. You did say that. Thank you. Can, can everybody hear in the back? Yeah, yeah. Why would that? Is, is it because hers might not be as loud? It's plenty loud. <laughs> it's plenty loud. <laughs> All right, so the, the first question, I think, and I, and I don't want to assume everyone knows exactly what ISIS is and what it stands for and all this, so maybe give us just a very quick, brief uh, understanding, what is ISIS? Okay, ISIS is an extremist, violent organization professing an extremist version of Islam as its raison d'etre, whose origins are in the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq. So every time you hear these accusations that ISIS emerged when Obama pulled the troops out of Iraq, you can sort of shake your head and say, oh, if only people were not so ignorant. Because the reality is ISIS began not when Obama pro pulled out the troops in 2011, grudgingly, but did that, so that was a good thing. But in 2004, at the height of the US occupation of Iraq, when in its earlier iteration, when it used to be called first Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, it was one of a bunch of Sunni-led resistance organizations that were fighting against the U.S. occupation in Iraq and against the U.S.-backed government that had been put in place. So that's the origins of it. And then it went through a number of iterations. It became more sectarian during the context of the sectarian civil war in Iraq. It became more powerful and then less powerful. It kind of got off the radar for a while in around 2008 and 9, and then re-emerged in 2011 in Syria, over the border, in the context of what had been the Syrian uprising, the part of the Arab Spring, and had quickly morphed into a civil war that now is actually seven separate wars being waged in Syria. But in that context, ISIS emerged with new levels of power and new military power and new levels of support, partly because of the incredible levels of sectarianism of the government in Iraq. So that's the sort of short version. I think it is important for all of us who spend our time fighting against wars and fighting to make the US respond with diplomacy instead of war in situations like this, not to try and pretend that it's not a horrifying organization, because it is. That doesn't mean that it has killed as many people as the US killed in Iraq. It's not even close. But that isn't the only standard that we can use. When an organization not only carries out violent action, but brags about its violent actions and, and posts the videos with such an extraordinary uh, video capacity, you know that this is a very dangerous and very bloody organization. So I do think it's important that the condemnations of it not be stopped because it's also true that they haven't killed nearly as many people as the U.S. military has. So The, the organization seems really sophisticated. Uh, it seems to have just kind of popped up quickly and took over, what, about a third of Syria? It controls yeah. about a third of Syria, about a third of Iraq. Mm -hmm. um, it's very well organized. It does trade. It hands out uh, passing papers, it has checkpoints, it does, it pays salaries. It's a lot of stuff for an organization that is just a rogue organization. Uh, who, makes up, who makes up ISIS? Who are these people? Okay, this is also an important question because I think that when ISIS first came out as a public thing that people in the U.S. were seeing as if it was brand new, 
which was mainly around 2012, even at the beginning, 2011, we didn't pay much attention. 2012, it sort of fell onto the radar a little bit. It wasn't really until 2013, the, when ISIS did its first land grabs uh, in, in Iraq and Syria and over the border, that it became something that people were paying a lot of attention to all of a sudden. So it made it look like it had just happened. It, it was like, where were these people? Well, they had been there all along. They had been there all along. We just weren't paying very much attention. Now, I think what's important to recognize is that they're powerful not because they're some kind of a magical uh, guerrilla organization that has figured out how to hold territory and take on the Iraqi army all by themselves, you know. They're a bunch of religious fanatics that have just figured this all out. It's not really like that. They're powerful because they don't fight alone. Now, what that means in the context of Iraq, for instance, they get political support from a lot of ordinary Iraqi Sunnis who tend to be very secular, have no interest in, in uh, uh, this kind of extremism in, in a religious sense, but they are desperate to figure out a way to fight back against the terrible militant sectarianism of the Shia-dominated government in Baghdad that the U.S. has put in power, armed, paid, kept in power. And the Sunni, who are a, a, a large minority, something around 20 to 25 percent, have been kind of isolated from any kind of access, not only to major power, but to any part of the, of the society. So there's a great deal of antagonism towards the government. And for a lot of people, there's a sense of, look, I don't like these guys, but maybe they can be the one force that can fight back. So that's one level of political support. Now, there's massive military support that they get, and this is perhaps the most ironic and the most depressing when you think about it. A lot of the military leadership of ISIS, particularly the part that has to do with actually taking on the Iraqi army, you know, the larger scale military attacks where they go after whole cities and occupy cities, it's because they have the top generals of the old Iraqi army who were summarily dismissed by Paul Bremer in the first acts of the U.S. occupation was to dismantle the Iraqi military. What was known as debathification meant, meant that they fired everybody in the Iraqi civil service. And all these people are sort of sent home with no job, no money, no way to support their family, let alone the kind of extra uh, privilege that they had had as a privileged minority under Saddam Hussein's government. And what happens? They've been waiting for 10 years or more to figure out a way to get back at this government that they hate. And they have become the military leaders of ISIS. So that's a really terrible thing to think about. You know, this is an army, of course, originally the U.S. was responsible for providing most of the arms to Saddam Hussein's army during the Iran-Iraq war. And later, the, the military uh, uh, was, was demolished and sent home with their weapons. So what a surprise. They, they reemerge and they take over the military leadership of this terrible organization who most of these guys would have no interest in supporting, except for the fact that it's giving them the basis to fight back against the, this terrible government, which I should just say, it's important to recognize that the government we're talking about in Iraq, it's not just that they're, they kind of don't privilege the Sunnis anymore, or they privilege the Shia, who are the majority. It's that their discrimination against Sunnis has been so profound that it's included mass killings in the streets, the bombing of a, a Sunni protest camp, killing who knows how many people, the, the arrest on a massive scale of, of Sunni activists of various sorts. So it, people have suffered enormously at the hands of this government. And the new prime minister sort of talks a much better talk than his, his, his predecessor, Nouri al-Maliki, but his practice isn't really much different. He talks the talk of inclusion and we have to get over the sectarianism, but he doesn't walk the walk. So people are still suffering with this terribly sectarian government. And it's important to, to uh, recognize that the sectarian government was really set up by the US. Uh, exactly. The provisional government that Brenner put together, which was divided along sectarian lines with the Shia and the Sunnis and the Kurds and others. Exactly. This was sort of the design of the U.S. occupation was to completely dismantle the political system that existed. And that meant, you know, firing all the military people, firing all the 
the civil servants firing everybody who knew how to run a modern society, in fact, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, they created a whole new political system that was based on uh, uh, new parties that were established not on the basis of people who have different ideas or something, but on the basis of religious identity, sectarian identity. So you had parties that were set up to represent the Sunnis, the Shia, as if all Sunnis or all Shia had one interest. You know, class doesn't matter, nothing else matters. So there's, you know, a Turkoman party, there's a, there's a Christian party, etc. And what it did was to institutionalize a level of of sectarianism in Iraq that had not been a, a feature of Iraqi society for a, for a century or more. And it's, it's incredibly sad for, for you know, those who are here that are from Iraq and know this firsthand, as you do, Andy, uh, and your family. I, it's, just, it's one of the shocking and horrifying things that what the U.S. puts in place is designed to divide people along sectarian lines. I was, uh, I was listening to one of the Democratic candidates, Martin O'Malley, who said, they asked him, what do you think is the, uh, brought on ISIS, and he says it was global warming. And he was explaining it. No, he, he had there's a, a... There's an aspect of it that's true. Yeah, he yeah. had, a, he had a, a good argument. Can you explain that argument? Well, part of the, 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 where, the place it's the most clear, actually, is in Syria. In Syria, I mean, the whole Middle East, right, is an area where water has been scarce for centuries, right? It's, it's not all a desert, but there are deserts within it, and water everywhere is, is treasured. Water is scarce. It's not easy. So Syria is one of the places that was known as the breadbasket of, of, the, of the Middle East, of the Arab world. Wheat grows. Syria has two rivers, right? So it was one of the countries that had significant, uh, significant water. But about eight years ago, the, a terrible drought began. It began, well, was it eight years? It began in about 2008, so that's, yes, about seven years ago. And it was the worst drought that had happened in about a century. And over the course of about three years of unrelenting drought, a lot of farmers were driven off, the, off their land. They could no longer earn a, a living. Even peasant farmers with a very small plot that was really only enough to feed their own families, you know, this, this kind of farming just became impossible. So people were driven off the land because of global warming, creating these drought conditions, and they were driven into the cities to find work. Now, in any situation like that, you're going to have not enough jobs for people flooding in looking for work. So in a situation where there's not enough jobs, but there's a few jobs, who gets those jobs? It tends to be people who know somebody. So in the context of Syria, which was very much like Iraq in the sense of a minority uh, government, a government that was made up largely of Alawites, a, a, an offshoot of Shia Islam, um, it doesn't mean everybody in government or everybody in power was an Alawite, but there was the, the people in the, in the highest levels of power mostly came from Alawite backgrounds. So the people who get the jobs that are so scarce tended to be Alawites. So you start to see in Syria, as you did in Iraq, the same kind of rising sectarianism because resentments begin to grow. Suddenly you can't get a job unless you're an Alawite or unless you know someone in power. And so the resentment starts to build. And it's in that context, that was one of the reasons that the explosion of opposition to this government that had been a very repressive government for a very long time. That wasn't new in 2011. You know, it was also a government that allied itself with the United States when it needed to, when it felt it was convenient for all of the rhetoric about uh, Bashar al-Assad being part of the axis of resistance across the Middle East. This was the same Bashar al-Assad who agreed to accept U.S. detainees to be tortured in Syria to, to get them to confess. But it was in that context that global warming played a very direct role in the creation, not specifically of ISIS, I don't think, but of the conditions of instability and rising sectarianism in which an organization like ISIS can flourish. Um, you speak for, for many of us who are uh, working toward peace and, and want to see a peaceful solution to this uh, problem. Uh, I know that lately that's been reversed in, in many ways and continues, the violence continues to escalate and recently Turkey has gotten involved in the act and of course Saudi Arabia has been involved in the act and um, I know Obama has been talking about 
he speaks one way. He says that we need to have diplomacy in order to resolve this problem and acts a different way by sending drones and bombings and ongoing air raids. Um, what's the U.S. interest really? I mean, it, if it's an issue between Shia and Sunni and it's a local issue and a, and a uh, somewhat a regional issue, why not just let them fight it out yeah. and see who comes to the top and let the government move forward? Yeah, that's kind of the argument of the State Department realist types is, you know, let them fight it out. This isn't our, we don't have a dog in this fight is the, you know, the sort of crass way that people will talk about it. Um, the problem is it's not really about which side wins in, in that context. It's about how to maintain U.S. power as a global superpower. So the, the, the confrontation is not only with you know, the U.S. is supporting a sh the Shia government in Iraq and opposing the Shia Alawite government in, in uh, Damascus. Well, what does that mean? How does that work? It's because it's not really about which faction or which sect is in power in any particular place, but it's about maintaining U.S. power. Oil is obviously a, a, a critical factor, but much less than it used to be because oil has become much less important in the global economy as the dangers of oil have become more obvious, the, the long-term cost of oil to the environment, to human survival of, of fossil fuels has become better known and the beginnings, and it's only the beginnings obviously, we have to work much harder on this, but the beginnings of moving away from fossil fuel dependency uh, is part of what has made oil, uh, control of oil and control of the oil industry, control of the oil pipelines somewhat less uh, strategically important than it used to be, although still very important. Um, but I think that it's also about control of a critically strategic territory. You know, the Middle East is the one part of the world where if you control the territory, you can attack three continents. You know, you can go after Africa, you can go after Asia, you can go after Europe from that very strategic place. So the question of the expansion of power is really critical there. If you look at the wars being waged in Syria, all of in the name of the Syrian civil war, all of these seven separate wars, one of them is between the US and Russia over things like sea lanes. Control of sea lanes becomes very important and control of, of naval bases. So there's a bunch of ways where the wars that are being fought right now have far less to do with the people of Syria, the people of Iraq, the people of Saudi Arabia, than it does about elites fighting it out. And if you ask the critical question, who benefits? It's the CEOs of the corporations that produce the bullets and the bombers and the planes and the bombs and all the stuff that gets the drones, all the stuff that's being used in these wars that are making a killing on these wars. Literally. Um, Literally. If you, so let's look around the entire region. Let's look one, one country at a time. Is, oh, and. Yeah if you could tell us what are the interests of those countries in this fight. So let's take Turkey. Okay. What's Turkey's interest? Turkey's interest is multiple, but I think Turkey's primary interest right now, the reason we're seeing this escalation in Turkey, is, is Kurdish, uh, Kurdish opposition. You know, the, the, Turks, the Turkish government has had a ceasefire with the Kurds, with the PKK, uh, over the last couple of years, and it's held quite well. It's, there's been negotiations underway, there's been release of prisoners. Uh, there's been a huge reduction in, in violence. Uh, be, you know, that was very characteristic of the struggle for, for Kurdish rights in Turkey. In the last couple of years, that violence has gone way down. Suddenly there's been a bit more uh, uh, tension and more violence, partly because the Kurds of, of any grouping in the region, it's not a country, but of, of all of the various players, the Kurds have probably gained the most influence and power in the context of this new version of the global war on terror more than anybody else. Because among other things, if you look at the Kurds in Iraq, while everybody was focused on Kobani and what was gonna happen in Kobani and the Kurds were, were the great heroes of that struggle to save the people of Kobani from the, what was likely to happen to them if, if ISIS had taken over in Kobani, during that same period, while nobody was looking, the, the Iraqi Kurds managed to just sort of move across the edge of Kirkuk and take over the city of Kirkuk, which is a long contested city. It's not part of Iraqi Kurdistan. It's outside the borders of Iraqi Kurdistan. 
but it is an oil-rich city relatively close to Iraqi Kurdistan, so the Kurds wanted it. They wanted the oil. The government in Baghdad was like, no way, we want the oil. So they were, they were fighting over Kirkuk. While nobody was watching, the Kurds moved in and they control uh, Kirkuk to this day. So that's the biggest issue for, uh, for Turkey. They're also concerned about their relationship with the United States. The US had been putting on enormous pressure for them to play a bigger uh, military role, particularly to allow US access to the, the air base at, in Sirlik, which people will remember in the early days of the Iraq war in 2003, there was a big scandal because the Turkish government said, we're going to allow the US to use the Insirlik base. And, it, and people were like, oh my god, this is going to be a complete game changer. This is going to make everything way, way worse. But the Turkish parliament came to the rescue. And the Turkish parliament said, no way, and voted it down. It was, a, it was like this great you know, defeat of imperialism by a democracy. It was kind of amazing. And right now, I don't know that the Turkish parliament is going to take that position. Iran. What's Iran's, uh, obviously Iran is a major player in this, and uh, what role do they have, and uh, what are their interests? Iran is a crucial regional power. Before the war, well, before the first Iraq war, or, yeah, before the first Iraq war, you could say that there were really only two countries in the Middle East that had the indigenous ability to be regional powers. I'm excluding Israel, which is really a derivative power. Um, but to be a, a regional power, you need size of, of land and population, you need water, sufficient water, and you need money. You need wealth, usually from oil. Iran and Iraq were the only two countries that had all three of those characteristics. The US wipes out Iraq as a regional power through 12 years of crippling sanctions and two wars. And suddenly Iran is the only one with those powers. Now Turkey kind of moved in uh, without oil with a very diverse economy and suddenly emerged as the 17th biggest economy in the world. So Turkey is kind of in that position as well. It has size, it has uh, water. So Turkey is, is competing, but Turkey is only half part of the Middle East. The other half is still oriented towards, Egypt, uh, towards Europe, so it's kind of in a different position. But Iran is the key regional power. That's why it's so important that the US be able to normalize relations with this country, because it's hugely important. Whether we like it or not isn't going to determine whether it's important. It's important because it's important, you know. So Iran is fighting for both regional power with its main competitor, Saudi Arabia, and it's fighting for religious sectarian reasons, also with its major s competitor, Saudi Arabia. So those are two of the wars going on in, in Syria, both being fought between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And Iran is a close ally of the Iraqi government. And of the Syrian government. Of exactly. the Syrian government. And they're helping Iraq to fight against ISIS. They're not only helping. The, the forces they have trained and paid the, the so-called Shia militias in Iraq are pretty much the only force on the ground with any capacity to take on ISIS and its allies. So Iran has played a huge role in, to the degree that, that anyone has been able to stop ISIS partly, it's been because of Iranian support that that's happened. So let's move on south, Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has changed lately. Saudi Arabia used to be a country that played everything behind the scenes. You know, it, it had very low-key diplomacy and, and usually just used money as its way of moving in the world instead of claiming to, to uh, be a military power, despite the fact that they have purchased more US arms than any other country in I don't know how long. Um, but the $60 billion deal that they did with US arms industries a few years ago that was led by Saudi Arabia, the Qatar and the UAE and a couple of other of the little gulfy mini-states were part of that, but it's mainly Saudi Arabia. They're, in, they're an interesting country that right now have a government that is in transition to a new generation of princes, but also have a government that's not so thrilled with being lorded over by a bunch of princes, new generation or not. So there's some edginess in the government that their, government, that their people may not be quite as uh, passive in the face of absolute monarchy control as they once were. And in the, if you look at the geography of, of Saudi Arabia, the oil region, the oil, well it's all an oil region, but the, the richest oil region in the east of the country is where the, the Shia majority is most influential. 
So it's a very tricky business because Iran is afraid, I, Saudi Arabia is afraid that Iran is going to be playing a role there. So all of these complicated regional factors are underway and one of the big questions is who's going to get to be Washington's best partner in the region? You know, it's been Israel and Saudi Arabia. Is that going to change? Where is Iran going to end up? Part of the reason that, that Saudi Arabia is so terrified about the U.S.-Iran deal is they're afraid of losing their privileged position vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Israel's not afraid of that. That's a whole other s story. But for Saudi Arabia, that's, the, that's a big part of their fear. And of course, we can't talk about anything in the Middle East without asking what's Israel's role in all this. Yeah, funny thing. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Israel um, actually has very little relevance to the actual wars that are underway and the actual interests of most countries. But politically, politically, not strategically, politically, posing Iran as the existential threat to the Israeli nation and to Jews everywhere has been Bibi Netanyahu's sort of uh, political credibility for 20 years or more. This has been the basis of his, uh, his argument for why he, people should keep electing him prime minister when he doesn't produce anything else. He hasn't helped the economy, he hasn't helped on I issues of inequality within Israel, nothing. He hasn't dealt with Israel-Palestine. None of that matters if Iran is an existential threat. Now, of course it isn't an existential threat. Let's not forget it's Israel that has the nuclear weapons. Iran doesn't even have a nuclear weapons program. It has a nuclear power program. If Iran ever decided it wanted to have a nuclear weapons program sometime in the future and decided to build a nuclear weapon sometime in the future, even that would not be an existential threat to Israel. It would be an existential threat to Israel's nuclear monopoly. That's what it threatens. It threatens the ability of Israel to be the only nuclear weapon state in the region, so the only one that can use that as a, a weapon to simply hold up for showing off their power. So that's Israel's kind of contention here. Israel is not worried the way Saudi Arabia is of losing Washington's embrace. That's not going to happen, and they don't think it's going to happen. They're worried that Iran might be normalized, that a, a, a relationship with the US and, of course, with, with Europe and, and uh, the kind of relationship that already exists with China and Russia would lead to an empowered Iran, which, among other things, at some point, I think Netanyahu, in his heart of hearts, is, among other things, worried that that would show that Iran is not any kind of a threat to Israel. And then Netanyahu would have nothing to claim. Thank you. You, you claim in the book um, eight different ways that are, that are alternatives to violence to be able to solve this issue, at least come closer to a resolution and ease the violence and the sectarian um, divisions that are happening in Iraq and in Syria. Can you address maybe a couple of those points? Because a lot of people yeah. would think that it's impossible to be able to deal with a group like ISIS, a group that's willing to put people on video and burn them to death and uh, cut their necks and all that stuff that makes people yeah. really queasy and upset for, for all good the right reasons. reasons yeah. um, you know, they would they would say like diplomacy. You can't talk to these people, and uh, it's hard to argue against that. Yeah. Uh, so how do you how do you address those issues and name some of the ways that you uh, yeah. have enumerated in the book? I think we have to start from the vantage point of something that President Obama has said over and over again. There is no military solution. If he really believed that, you would wonder why is the only action that we see military action, you know? It's not working, what a surprise. He said it wasn't gonna work. Why are we surprised it's not working? But it's not only not working by itself, it's also making it impossible to do any of the various diplomatic and negotiations and money-based and, and legal-based and all the various things that can be done. Because as long as the U.S. is engaging in this way, you know, if you look, for example, at what happens if the, the U.S. bombs uh, some ISIS camp in Iraq, and they get it right, one of the rare moments, they get it right. They don't bomb a bunch of civilians because they got the wrong coordinates or something. They get it right, and they kill a bunch of people in ISIS. And then the U.S. says, yay, we got the bad guys. That's fine in a wartime situation. 
But what does that look like to people who live there? So to Iraqi Sunnis, what they see is, yep, once again, the US is coming in acting as the Air Force in, uh, in the interests of the Kurds and the Shia against the Sunnis. So it looks entirely different than it looks to somebody in Washington saying, yay, we got the bad guys. So we have to start, I think, my, and I would urge people if you, you know, the book is done as frequently asked questions, so you don't have to like read it in order or anything. Read the last two questions. Those are the most important. If you don't read anything else, read those two. Those are, if, if they're so violent, don't we have to use force and what else could we do? What should the US do? And then the last one, what should we as people do to make that happen? Those are the important questions. The rest is all, you know, gravy. But, so number one is first, do no harm. So make good on the claim that there is no military solution and stop using military action. Withdraw the troops, stop the drones, stop all the stuff that's not working and that's killing people and that's antagonizing people and that's creating more terrorists. That's all number one. Number two and three, I think it is, I, I can't remember the order, but go back to diplomacy. Now I don't think that necessarily means we try to engage directly with with uh, al-Baghdadi right now. It's not realistic, nobody's calling for that. The ISIS probably isn't interested in it right now. That's not the only kind of diplomacy you need. You need to start with who are the other players? Who's arming who? And how do we stop the flow of arms into the region? So we do need diplomacy to and, s and who are these people? Who? Okay, that means all of the various the, forces. Uh, the Saudis, of course. The Saudis, the Qataris, the UAE, Jordan, Turkey, that whole gang that are all allied to the US. They're all giving or selling US weapons to all the various opposition forces, including ISIS, including Al Qaeda, including the, the, the small, brave, secular opposition, some of who don't even want the weapons, but the only way they can get any attention is to take the weapons. I mean, that's a whole other serious problem. But you need to have serious negotiations with those people to say, and, and number four, I think, is we need an arms embargo. We need to stop flooding the region with arms. Right? Now that's probably the hardest one of all. That's harder than negotiating with ISIS. Why? Because look who has power in this town. You know those full page ads you see in the Washington Post and in the metro station for McDonnell Douglas, we go where we're needed, Boeing, we fight so you don't have to, or whatever their slogans are. You know, you look at these things and you say, what the hell, are they trying to sell me a bomber? And I, those ads I, are know? paid by taxpayers' money. No, 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 those ads are paid by Boeing. Yeah, but, but they get well, the yes. money from, wait a minute, uh, wait a course. minute, yes. this taxpayers' money, yes, it's right. basically yes, money laundering right. is what happens, right? It's right? true, but the, the point is, money it's money laundering. Money laundering, so, yeah. So, you know, you look at that and say, why are they putting up a full page ad in the, in the Washington Post for a bomber? Who do they think is gonna go out and buy one? They, that ad is aimed at a very small audience of about 35 people. The, the members and the staff of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and the House Armed Services Committee, and their staffs. Maybe it's 50 people. That's who that's aimed at. We have to look at it, but that's who it's aimed at. So that's really hard, but you can't, you know, there's, there's talk in Washington a lot of, we've got to pressure Iran and Russia to stop arming uh, Bashar al-Assad's government. Damn straight, as far as I'm concerned, it's a terrible government and they should stop arming them. But why do we think that we have any credibility to demand that when we are arming and funding the other side? So if we're serious, and so far we're not as a government, we are serious as a movement, but the government who claims to represent us is not yet serious. If we're serious about diplomacy, yes, everyone has to be at the table, and that means everyone, eventually. But it also means we can't have diplomacy expect to work if there are new weapons flooding the region on a daily basis. So we've got to say to our allies, you're not getting any more of our weapons. We're not going to let you buy any more weapons as long as you are giving them or selling them or allowing them to be stolen or whatever to these opposition forces. Then we have the basis to go to Russia and Iran and say, and you know what? We just stopped funding it. You gotta stop funding the, uh, arming the other side. All right, that, that sounds really wonderful and it's worthy of applause, but it really, I mean, if you think about it, the realistic part That's of that. That's not gonna happen right and, away. And, uh, but here, we give a lot of money to many of these governments 
with the promise that they buy arms from us. So right. we give $47 billion to Israel in the next 10 years, right? And well, Not officially yet, it hasn't been decided on yet, but yes, it's going it to be, be about, $47 about billion. Dollars well, over it might be 60 years. billion by the time this uh, deal with Iran is over. Yeah. Uh, but so all of that money has to be then used to buy, purchase arms, or 75%. Right. 75% of the money we give to Israel has to be used to purchase arms from US um, arms manufacturers. 100% um, of the money we give to Egypt, for instance, has to be spent Saudi to Arabia. purchase arms from U.S. manufacturers. So for, we, we've set up a situation that is a never-ending cycle uh, of supply and demand. But we have to start talking about that, Andy. If we ever think it's going to happen 30 years from right. now, we so have where to start do, So about where do now. we need to talk? Do we need to go to Congress and talk? Do we need to go to the arms manufacturer's home and shame them? like Medea Benjamin and Code Pink does, do we need, because... The absolutely. answer is yes. We need to do all of that. We need to name and shame, and I, I did this on, I was on the Hill a day or two ago for a briefing uh, sponsored by the um, Progressive Democrats, Progressive Democrats of America. Hey, Progressive Democrats, Stephen, it's Progressive Democrats, yay. There we go. And we talked about... Hey, talked how are you? We talked about some of the poster boys of war profiteers. When you look at CEO pay, if you go back a few years, and my colleague Sarah Anderson, who was here earlier, I don't know if she's still here. She's here. She wrote this amazing report on CEO pay of war profiteers that said, among other things, the CEOs of war industries in the period of three years starting in 2003 when the Iraq war started, when all the main corporations raised their CEO pay between 7 and 12 percent, and we're talking multi-million dollar salaries already, the war profiteers got raises in the area of 200%. And one in particular, a guy named David, hmm, I'm forgetting his last name. Sarah, help me out. Brooks. Yeah. David Brooks, whose company manufactured what were supposed to be bulletproof vests that were purchased by the Pentagon. His pay raise in that three-year period was 13,500%. He went from half a million dollar salary to a $70 million salary, and it turned out that his bulletproof vest did not stop a bullet. 5,000 of them had to be recalled, and we don't know how many U.S. soldiers may have been killed because their so-called bulletproof vest didn't stop a bullet. So these are the people that have to be named and shamed and called out. We also need to be talking to Congress, but we need, first of all, to be talking to our people, the people of this country. That means we have to be writing letters to the editor, calling radio talk shows, doing all the stuff that you think, oh my God, do I have to do this again? And the answer is yes, you do. Because the first letter you write will never be published. Either will the second or the third, but the 13th will. And there's no shortcut. You can't sit down to write the 13th letter to the editor. You have to write the first and the second and the third, and it's like, oh my God, really, again? Yes, again. That's what we have to do. We have to reach people in the schools. This is why teaching for change is so important, to change the curricula of how our children are educated. So we grow up looking at what role could the US play as, an, as a bastion of disarmament, not just non-proliferation. You know, starting with our own arms, our own disarmament. All right, we're going to open it up for questions uh, from the audience. There is a microphone somewhere here. Uh, Marjan, you want to help me? Or maybe Shelly? Either Shelly or Marjan. Who wants to do it? Do we have a mic? Marjan, you do it. If you can grab the microphone, it's right there. It's not on mic. Okay, my brother wants to take the first question. Okay. Since he's I Iraqi, uh, uh, Iraqi origin, he gets to have first question. So Iraqis, Iranians, Saudis, Israelis, they get first priority. So before anybody, anybody else. Anybody the neighborhood is what you're saying. <laughs> anybody from that neighborhood. <laughs> well, thank you, Phyllis. I wanted to find out, you touched on it a little bit, but I wanted to find out what your thoughts are if this nuclear deal with Iran does not go through, and God forbid something worse, yeah. 
like some kind of military intervention takes place. Yeah. What, what's the, what, what is the consequences to the ISIS situation? I'm just curious yeah. to see your point. No, thanks, Yasser. That's a really important question. And at this moment, frankly, over the next, I guess it's now, we're about 54 days out from the deadline, the single most important thing for folks to be working on is to prevent Congress from undermining this deal. This deal is a huge victory. It's a huge victory for diplomacy over war. And if they succeed at destroying it, it's going to be not only a huge danger in the immediate, but a long-term danger because it will, it will provide some kind of evidence to people around the world who will say, you can't deal with the US. They don't, uh, they don't abide by anything they sign on to. So we're simply not going to negotiate with them anymore. I mean, the, the long-term consequences are huge. Now, the immediate consequences could go a number of ways, all quite dangerous. The reality is, although the agreement is signed not by, between the US and Iran, but between six, six of the most powerful countries in the world and Iran, and the UN Security Council now and Iran, the role of the US is still crucial, still central, and it can still be a spoiler. So if the US says, we are not going to lift any of our sanctions, we're not going to allow US banks to be a pass-through for oil money, because since the oil industry globally trades in dollars almost entirely, not in euros, not in yuans, in dollars, uh, the US has an enormous stranglehold on that uh, industry to be able to just say, Iran is not going to be able to do that. What it will mean for the people of Iran who have suffered through so many years of this, these crippling sanctions that mean that medicines are not accessible, uh, spare parts for the civilian aircraft are not accessible, all of these things will continue. The question of what Iran would do in response, you know, at the moment I have actually a bit more faith in the Iranian regime and the Iranian parliament being at least slightly more rational than the, the hotheads in the US parliament, if you will. So it doesn't necessarily mean that Iran will immediately respond and say, we have, no, we have no partner for peace here, to use an old term. We have no basis for continuing this. We're going to, you know, we're going to move ahead and, and start producing a nuclear weapon, and we're going to enrich a lot more uranium. We're going to, uran we're going to enrich it to much higher levels. We're going to build a nuclear bomb. I don't think that's going to happen right away. But I think the problem is we don't know what's going to happen. And the question of Israel feeling empowered, which is not likely to mean a, an Israeli strike on Iran right away, but it certainly means that, it, that Israel would feel completely empowered to attack Gaza again, something they already feel pretty empowered to do. They might decide to go after Hezbollah again. I mean, the, the regional ramifications could be enormous, and we don't really know exactly how far it could go. So that's why I think right now, the most important thing is to mobilize, and we know APAC just last week, they didn't announce it, but the New York Times did our work for us and, and, and revealed it. They created a new organization called Citizens for a Nuclear Free Iran, and gave it $20 million for an ad and lobbying campaign of just this 60-day period. Now, we can't match that in terms of money, but we can match it in terms of facts because theirs is based on lies. We can match it in terms of passion and power because theirs is based on hiring people to do robocalls. And we can match it on the basis of we stand for peace and not for more war. Anybody who says that they want a better agreement is saying that they want Iran's surrender. Iran's not going to surrender. So if they reject this agreement, they are calling for war instead of diplomacy, and they need to be called out on exactly that. Great point, and I think, I think this is a really important point to uh, reemphasize. Um, I know that Code Pink is doing a lot of work on that issue, and they're focused on it for the next 54 days. Uh, that's the commitment. How many of you here are planning or are working on the Iran deal to go through? Show of hands. That's good, right. not good enough. We need more. It's not good enough. We really need everybody's hands Congress to go up. Congress right now is the target. Not, not just to go up, but actually do the work. Uh, I think it's really important to, maybe to afterwards to 
Uh, you want to say something, Ty? Yeah, I, I, in the next 30 days, you want to get the microphone? all representatives and your senators are going to be in the district. If you know somebody back in the district, call them up, get them to go to the offices, because that's where the, the action is going to be in the next 30 days. Right. Uh, and, and there's going to be lots of actions that are going to be taking place. Please, uh, you, know, you want to say something, Medea? Well, we'll pass around a sign-up sheet, but when Phyllis just talked about Apex New Group, maybe we should start a Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Israel, and if you'd like to be on that... How about for a Citizens for a Nuclear-Free Israel and United States? A nuclear-free Middle East, I think that would be also one exactly. way to put it. I think it's really important to also... Uh, n not just uh, to have a nuclear-free Israel, uh, you know, movement because that's a much longer process, but something more directly uh, focused on Middle the East. 54 Absolutely. days that we've got uh, that are coming up. I think it's really important, and this is a huge, huge uh, victory, I think, for the peace movement if we were to get this deal to go through and would be a huge defeat for APAC and those war hawks that continue wanting to uh, see this kind of uh, turmoil. Uh, in the Middle East. We should also remember that the U.S. is officially on record as supporting a weapons of mass destruction free zone throughout the Middle East. This was passed in, in uh, Article 14 of Resolution 687 that ended the Gulf War in 1991 in what they called the mother of all resolutions because it was like 30 pages long. And when we asked State Department people about it, they said, oh, we knew nobody would ever take it seriously. And we said, well, we take it seriously. And their answer was, yeah, well, who are you? We have to show them who we are. This is U.S. policy, officially, because it's a Security Council resolution, which U.S. diplomats actually drafted and passed unanimously in the Security Council. So it's one of those things that we should hold, hold them accountable to that. Yeah. So um, ISIS has always talked about the collapse of sex because of they've denied the sort of the, the president of sex because. So what do you think that narrative means for the future of the region going forward? Should ISIS be defeated? Yeah, the, the question references the Sykes-Picot agreement, uh, the Sykes-Picot line that drew lines in the, sta in the sand in 1919 when the Ottoman Empire had been defeated by the British and French empires and they were taking over all the territory that was now going to be um, uh, it was now going to be available for the new empire. And Sykes and Picot, one Brit and one French guy, sat with a map and drew lines and created countries. They created Iraq, they created Kuwait, they created Syria, Lebanon, none of the Saudi Arabia, Jordan, none of these were separate countries before. They were Arabia with divisions of, there were cities, there were regions that were identifiable and had, had regional governments for sure, but they weren't countries. In any, in any international sense. And at the time, just like what happened in Africa, when, when colonial powers went in and drew lines in the sand, uh, lines in the jungle perhaps in, 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 uh, in parts of Africa, lines in the sand in other parts of Africa, lines in the sand in the desert. But these Westerners coming to these former colonies and deciding who should own them was exactly what happened. And many people throughout the region believe that the Sykes-Picot Agreement was never something that was legitimate, w never took into account the histories of where people were. They also created uh, monarchies that were deliberately chosen and created to bring people from outside so they wouldn't have local support. So the, the new king of Saudi Arabia was actually taken from what's now Jordan. The Jordanian king was from what's now Saudi Arabia. You know, there was this whole manipulation of powers and land. So it's not at all clear that when the current instability and, and war and ISIS expansionism is over, that the existing countries that we knew five years ago are going to look the same, that the borders are going to be the same. And that's probably not by itself the worst thing in the world. Uh, the change in colonial borders has always been opposed, for example, in, in, in uh, Africa, the African Union one of the first things they did on creating what used to be called the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, one of their first decisions was an agreement that despite how backwards it is, we are not going to re try and rewrite colonial borders because the violence that it would create would be worse. That's true in the Middle East as well, and we see what's happened as a result of the violent 
destruction of the border between Iraq and Syria by ISIS. It's created enormous violence, enormous suffering. But how it will end up right now, given that that's already happened, I don't think we know yet. I think that it's, there, you're already starting to see stuff in foreign policy magazine, in other very mainstream journals, that ISIS may succeed. They may succeed in creating a new state. It may become the new normal. It may be that the extraordinary violence of ISIS as a guerrilla force will diminish over time when it is primarily about governing rather than primarily about expanding further. It may not. We don't know. But they, in one of the articles like that that I read recently, they were comparing it to earlier revolutionary processes that led to the establishment of independent countries after enormous levels of violence. The examples included the French Revolution and the US Revolution, uh, which were enormously violent, killed you know, huge numbers of people. And then, had, by, when they ended, when the fighting ended, there were new countries that had not existed in that way before. That could happen again. Um, how many people uh, want to ask questions? Just want to see kind of a, try to pace ourselves because we need to, we have about maybe 30 minutes left to finish the program. So one, Should two, three, four, five, six or so. All right. So if you didn't raise your hands, please, you know, if you plan not to, uh, that would be great. And then uh, we can have the book signing afterwards. So quickly, yeah. some questions. I want to go back to the politics of getting the Iran deal approved. Uh, Congressman Van Hollen is one of the congressmen who's still undecided. And I know many people have various opinions of him, but if you live in his district in Maryland, please, please, please call his office. Even more important, there are only 13 senators who are undecided, and four of them are the two in Virginia and the two in Maryland. And again, you may not like some of them, but if you live in Virginia or Maryland, call your senators. It's essential. Call them daily. Yes. And this is not a partisan issue. So whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, I don't think that's a, necessarily a partisan issue. Or absolutely. Independent or anything. Um, first, I just want to say, Phyllis, um, what an amazing speaker, intellectual, and um, driving force behind this movement that you've been presenting. And um, I don't know what we would do without you. And I was so thrilled the past few months to see you on uh, MSNBC. And I certainly hope that um, whatever is being done to get you on more mainstream television will will prove to be fruitful. So that's one thing. Thank you. I want to bring the discussion a little bit home, so to speak. Um, so I think everyone in this room knows that you know ISIS has taken the place, perhaps, of Al Qaeda, which took the place of the communists. You know, in terms of being the new boogeyman. So I'm wondering, here in the United States, in this mass surveillance state, and in the context of rising Islamophobia, what is this whole ISIS thing going to mean for, for certain people in this country, do you think? Very important question, thank you. Um, it's certainly true that Islamophobia continues on the rise. One of the, perhaps the most specific of the eight things I say should be part of our new policy has to do with overturning a very specific uh, uh, Supreme Court decision of the, that deals with providing material support for terrorism. The case is Holder versus, uh, I'm blocking the name of it, it's the um, Holder versus, somebody help me, is there a law student in the crowd? Uh, anyway, it's, it doesn't, the name doesn't actually matter. It's a case that held that providing any organization that is on the U.S. list of foreign terror organizations with anything counts as providing material support for terrorism. And the court explicitly found that that includes nonviolence training, training in how to access the United Nations human rights system, training in alternatives to violence. So all of the things that might be possible to reach you know, members of ISIS, who knows, potential recruits for ISIS, all of these things now 
people can't do without being afraid of being arrested and charged with this very serious crime of providing material support to terrorism. So it's, it's a huge question of how these wars come home and how Islamophobia at home and the mass incarceration of people in the context of uh, people who are flying while Arab, walking while turbaned, etc. All of those things help justify the wars. So it works in both directions. And I think that we constantly have to keep in mind how racism plays a part in building support for these wars, the demonization. It's, not, it's one thing to demonize an organization like ISIS. They should be demonized. But demonization of ISIS is never separate from demonization of Muslims that go into that sort of thing. So the link with, with Islamophobia and the need to challenge Islamophobia every step of the way is really crucial. Uh, I have the microphone. Um, Phyllis, I've been listening to you since uh, Tom Porter and Morning Conversation over 20 years ago. You're great. Thank um, you. You mentioned that Israel, I think that it is strategically important for Israel that ISIS exists. I think for the last 20 years that a major strategic decision by Israel is that to encourage civil wars in the Arab countries around Israel to get them off of Israel's backs and also to slow down support, direct support from those countries to Palestine. And to me, ISIS, by involving a lot of people, uh, keeps these people away from Israel. And I'm curious rhetorically what ISIS says about Israel. I do not hear things from ISIS condemning Israel. And I actually believe, in my conspiracy-oriented mind, that is it possible that ISIS is a gigantic agent provocateur to make terrorism look horrible, to make these extreme things of beheadings and so on, so that we can ignore the million to three million Iraqis that we killed and not worry about that, those horrors, but to concentrate us on the horrors of Muslims, of Arabs, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I certainly think that the existence of ISIS plays that role to some degree. I don't agree that it's uh, an Israeli creation. I, th I also think that um, Israel has more of an interest in, for example, keep, it would have much preferred to keep Bashar al-Assad in power. Bashar al-Assad and his father were a great help to Israel. Uh, again, as I said earlier, despite the, the rhetorical claims that Syria is at the, at the root of the, the axis of resistance in the region, they never helped the Palestinians other than rhetorically. The, the massacre of Tel Azatar, for instance, in 1976 by the, by the Assad regime, the, the fact that for years uh, both Assads have kept the Golan Heights, the occupied Golan Heights, quiet, kept the border safe, kept the border secure for Israel. Uh, I think Israel would much prefer to have stable dictatorships on its border that it would deal with and has dealt with, as the U.S. has over the years, rather than having the threat of instability come over its borders as they're facing right now, for example, in, uh, in the Sinai. So I don't think it's uh, to Israel's interest uh, to have this level of instability. They take advantage of it as they take advantage of everything, and certainly the effect of this kind of violence does have the effect of diverting public attention from the Israeli occupation, from Israeli apartheid, from the attacks on Gaza, etc. Um, but I think Israel would prefer to have um, stable Arab countries that they could attack rhetorically but not have to worry about too much except an occasional cross-border foray of one sort or another which they can easily absorb. Um, I think that's much in, in, in their interest. Questions? Um, oh, one of the most chilling things that I've read, actually, that I saw, it was a viral video, um, a viral. was about ISIS, a viral video, uh, was about ISIS recruiting ordinary, uh, and by that I mean um, just Americans, uh, not people who are Muslim, uh, this video was about some, some young woman who lived in uh, Washington State, I think it was. Uh, people, young people who are lonely, who maybe are a little bit depressed, and that this is a way of giving them some kind of meaning and purpose in life. And it was this very, very chilling video about this young woman out you know, in the Upper Northwest 
Um, and the very kind of insidious way that she was recruited online by someone appearing to be her kind of charming online friend. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit and yeah. how, how prevalent and how dangerous is that yeah. or is it nothing? It's, it's not nothing. It's not much of an issue in the US. There's been a few very high profile um, individual cases. There were the two young women from Colorado. There's been uh, you know, a few dozen cases. It's not primarily happening in the US. It is happening all over Europe. It's particularly happening in Tunisia. Um, most of the people being recruited are Muslims. Most are not extremist in their views. Most are pretty secular. They're generally second or third generation immigrant families. Uh, and one of the things that's so crucial around this is that with so much focus on the military response to ISIS, there's been way too little discussion and way too little resources put into the much more important broad question of what do we do about the fact that there are young people growing up in our societies, for those in the West and for, for certain parts of the, of the Arab world, Tunisia, ironically, the, the one great success story of, of the Arab Spring, has sent more fighters to ISIS than any other country, and it's a very small country. So it's, you know, it, there's a lot of issues that have to be dealt with. Of how is it that they are attracting people to this? Now there's, some of it is, you know, the levels of violence, the kind of up close of personal violence attracts a certain kind of sociopath or psychopath. That's, that's, one, that's one aspect, but that doesn't seem to be the majority. They are, and they need because they are running cities. They are, you know, they are ruling a, what amounts to a country, whatever form it takes. They need engineers, they need doctors. There was a, a, a woman gynecologist from the UK who was recruited to open a pregnancy clinic for the wives of ISIS fighters in, the, in Raqqa, the capital, the self-declared capital in, in, uh, in Syria. And this kind of recruitment uh, is particularly dangerous when they're looking at people with the skills that they need. They need engineers who can keep the oil uh, industry running. You know, Syria doesn't have a huge oil industry, but it's not insignificant. It's there, and they need people who can keep it going. They need teachers. They're recruiting families. And one of their recruiting videos, for instance, you know, we see the videos, or we hear about the videos of the horror of the, these horrible, uh, uh, violent acts. But one of their, their videos that's been very widely distributed in, in uh, the UK shows ISIS fighters and their families at a family picnic. They have like a... Uh, uh, a, a, um, a pony ride set up and the kids are eating cotton candy and it's like an amusement park. And this is what they're advertising. Now, there is a theory, and I think it's as good as any other theory in this, in this context, that their inability to maintain that kind of a life is going to lead to the collapse from within of the society they are creating. That to the degree that they recruit people on the basis of, we're going to give you the kind of life you don't find. You're going to be respected. You're going to be taken seriously. You're going to have your religion taken seriously. Not like living in the suburbs of Paris where nobody, you know, you can't get a job. You, you can't get any respect anywhere. It's not going to be like that. To the degree that they fail to do that, they will face massive uh, efforts to leave, massive upheavals. How that will play out, we don't know. That's quite a long ways away, I'm afraid. But I think the, the issue is a very important one right now for many European countries and a few Arab countries. It's less of an issue for the United States. Uh, we don't have the same level of, we have repression of Muslim and Arab communities here. We don't have the same level of disconnection that I think you do see in, in uh, parts of Europe. I think it's also important not to over sensationalize such such videos because I'm, frankly, I'm more afraid of young people being recruited to be white supremacists. And, and Very good point. And those types of situations happen far more frequently. They may not go on viral videos, but they certainly are all around us. We see that happening all the time. So it's, it's uh, you know, I want to be a little careful about not, not over focusing on, on such uh, incidents like that. Um. Thank you, Phyllis. I'm really glad to be here. I just bought your two books, so I've got my reading sorted out for the summer. Um, 
as an Iraqi myself who has grown up in or grew up in Baghdad and left, um, I have seen Marhaba. the exodus. Um, I have seen the exodus of Iraqi Jews. Um, Baghdad had a very very large population of Jews. I actually went to a Jewish school in Baghdad myself. Um, Frank Amy, you might know it. Um, and now I see something very similar happening with the Christians of Iraq. I am a very secular person. Um, do you have anything to say about what you think is going to be um, the new um, frontiers for I Iraqi Christians? Thank you. You know, you raise a very important question, which is not only about Iraqi Christians, but about Iraqi Turkmen's, about Iraqi Jews, uh, about not so many Jews left, but a few, uh, about all of the minority communities in the Middle East, many of whom, many of those communities were, uh, were protected by dictators in different countries um, and lived well uh, within those societies. Um, I think the sectarianism has risen, as we know, and Christians are paying a huge price, as are other minorities. There's the uh, New York Times Magazine this week has a big cover story on the exodus of Iraqi Christians. We've also seen a huge exodus of Palestinian Christians, uh, not because of, of, uh, of uh, Islamism, uh, but because of Israeli occupation and because the Christians in Palestine tended to be people with more likely to have ties outside and the money to be able to get a visa somewhere, um, they're the ones that are leaving. So the, the percentage of Christians in Palestine is now down to, to a, a tiny percent. Um, I don't know how this is going to play out. We're seeing it in Syria as well. Christians are leaving, as are other, other minorities. Uh, and you know the, the emergence of societies that are overwhelmingly Sunni and Shia and almost no other minorities is, is such a tragic attack on, on the extraordinary richness of Arab societies. You know, this is something that doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, and I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, we see uh, protection of the Christians being used by right-wing forces across the United States as this is why we have to stop the war to protect the Christians. You know, it doesn't matter how many Muslims get killed, we, we just have to protect the Christians. Uh, you know, the Christians are leaving Palestine because the, the Muslims are attacking them, you know, and thankfully there's organizations like uh, Sabil in Palestine or like the, the um, uh, what's the statement from Palestinian Christians? Um, the, Kairos, the Kairos statement that says very clearly, we are being driven out of our homeland by Israeli occupation and apartheid, not by our Muslim brothers and sisters. But how that's ultimately going to play out, there is no protection except on a case-by-case on a, a -case basis. You know, a, a group of Kurds in one place may be protected, a, a Christian community in one place may find protection somewhere. But as whole communities, I don't know. I don't know how this is going to play out. It's really important to reemphasize how secular Iraqi society was prior to the war. Um, this was a society that was multi ethnic, uh, different religions. And different Syrian society people. as well. Coexisted. I'm sorry. Syrian society as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Many of these societies in the Middle East were extremely secular. Uh, oftentimes the lines between different groups you never even addressed, never even noticed uh, until this war happened and created a whole different dynamic between these groups. Uh, I think we have time maybe for two more questions. So Phyllis, thank you very much for this book and for coming out tonight. I'm Ty Perry from Code Pink Man for Peace. And I would just like to ask you, is there any concrete evidence that Saudi Arabia has helped extremist groups? And we notice that the government keeps playing with the words ISIL, ISIS, IS. I've heard all the arguments. What's your uh, take on that? And also, That's what's the story? Only two questions, Ty. Come on. Two what's questions. the story with the Khorasan group? OK, maybe three. The, the, the last one first, the Khorasan group probably doesn't exist. It's a grouping within uh, Al-Qaeda that may have been some kind of a collective of, of some kind of a grouping within Al-Qaeda that somebody decided to focus on at one point when they needed some evidence that ISIS uh,
because ISIS was not a threat directly to the United States, the big difference between ISIS and Al-Qaeda is Al-Qaeda wants to come to the United States, among other places, and blow up things, or did in the past, and ISIS has no interest in that. They have a, another whole strategy. But if you say that, then why is ISIS a threat to us, is the, is the response. And so people say, well, there's this other group. It's called the Khorasan Group, which is actually a small group within uh, um, Al-Qaeda, Al which most people think at this point doesn't even exist. People in the region all said, who? What are they? So they're not, they're a propaganda stunt. The, um, oh, see now I forgot the other the two names. questions. The name. Okay, so the names, there's one of the questions in the book goes through the whole history of all the various names. I would just say that the one name that I find the most offensive is the one that the United States State Department and the White House insist on using. I don't know why they insist on using it, which is ISIL. And the reason that one I think is more offensive, that's not one that ISIS ever picked for itself. The, ISIL ref, uses the term Levant, which is the French colonial term for what used to be called Greater Syria. Now why would you choose the colonial word when you're trying to portray yourself as not a colonialist, right? So that one's just nuts. For the rest you can read it in the book. And the third question... Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia. Right, that's the most important one. So the answer is yes, but. There is evidence that there is Saudi money. There is not clear evidence that whether that money is coming from the government, from any particular princes, from government-sponsored agencies. All of that is very blurry and there's no clarity. There is no question that a significant amount of the money going to a whole host of extremist elements uh, in the region uh, is coming from Saudi Arabia. But Saudi Arabia is made up of about 27, 000, uh, 27 million people, so we don't have good evidence on exactly where it's coming from. Uh, can I, <clears throat> do we have time for two quick questions? Yes. He has his hand up on Diane. Do you have a question, Marjan? No. Okay. <laughs> um, hi there, Francisco. Um, okay, so whether it's arming moderates or uh, Getting mar moderates to shame their children. Uh, there's a lot of talk. There's persistent talk about reaching out to moderate Muslims, which brings with it its own issues of why are we pinning the actions of some self-professed fundamentalist group on Muslims of all stripes everywhere. Um, if you were to pursue that option or of reaching out to moderates, I imagine that you have to have trust first. But in Germany, in France. In the US where the FBI is sending an agent to infiltrate mosques across the country, that trust isn't there, so we really can't have that conversation. But if we're trying to undermine the ability of this quote unquote radical group to reach out to young people and to sway the young people, is, this, is there a constructive conversation to be had there between government and civil society groups, or, is, or, or do we really have to just go back on this the geopolitic, uh, geopolitics, the, the diplomacy approach, diplomatic approach. I think the question is who are you talking to and about? If we're talking about what should our government be doing, yes, it should be doing stuff diplomatically. Its job is not to move within the, the Muslim community and whatever. There's no basis for that. Um, I think that there are Muslim or identified organizations who spend a lot of their time trying to figure out they're the ones worried about their own children being recruited by this stuff. It is mostly Muslim kids that are being recruited. Um, it's not just any old kids that they go after. They go after mostly Muslim kids. So that's who's the most affected, and they're, they're desperately trying to figure that out, and they're the ones doing that work. I think that work needs to be supported, but they need to say what that support is that they need, and it's mostly not from the government. So I think the job for us in this country, including those who are Muslim but also those who are not, is to push our government to stop doing what they're doing Number one, first do no harm. Go back to the, you know, the old thing that they tell doctors. First do no harm. It's the Hippocratic Oath. Stop the bombing. Withdraw the troops. We now have three, more than 3,000 troops again on the ground in, in Iraq. 10,000 still in Afghanistan that we don't talk about at all. That's got to stop. Any future discussions, whatever, is off the table until that's over. So I think the question is, what do we do as governments? We focus on what our government needs to be doing and not doing. Yeah. All right, last question. Okay. Um, all right, Diane, uh, thank you very much. Anyway, I've been very intensely immersed in this and also been dealing with it since 2007 in some form. And, what I, and I attend, thanks to Code Pink, I attended the hearing last Thursday, the Senate hearing, and I stayed for the whole four and a half hours, and I also watched the other one on TV. And I keep thinking of the Yates quote, like those who are um, sort of ignorant or full of passion, you know, while decent people are full of 
itself down. And that there's a, a very distorted, that the people who are against it are really clear and coherent in their message. And then, at least in the US media, and then the pe other people are sort of falling all over themselves, trying to you know, not accept it. So I'm very focused on the, me the, um, the issues that are raised against it, like, and I'm, and I'm writing talking points to answer them. So one is all the $150 billion are gonna go to fund Hezbollah. So, I mean, I answered that using, quoting Jacob Blue, Secretary Blue, who's an Orthodox Jew. Um, and then, um, you know, they say death to America. You know, there's sort of homogenization of all of Iran is, you know, saying death to America. Um, and anyway, anyway, so I think I'm trying to work on like which arguments are most appealing and compelling. And I, th I think that the deal would increase Israel's security and defeating the deal would make Israel much less secure, the opposite of what they're, they're saying there. And a question that I would ask, so I want to ask you about framing that. And I think a question people could ask their Congress members who are going to say, would you vote for it if you thought it would make Israel more secure? And, you know, and some people think there's some common interest, that is, uh, Israel and Iran have some common interest and there's a potential down the line for reconciliation, so. Okay, thanks. I think, I mean, the bottom line is any argument that you think will work with your particular member of Congress right now is the time to use it. I think it's a little bit harder to make the argument about what's going to be the effect on Israel because there's so many arguments to come back to on that. So I, I'm not sure that's the easiest one to make. But I think there are plenty of arguments. I think the petitions that are out there, sign them all. Uh, Win Without War has a good petition out there. The key this week is to get letters to the editor out there using these talking points of, you know, whether the, the $150 billion, keep in mind, number one, this is, this is not $150 billion anybody's gonna give to Iran. This is Iran's money that will be unfrozen from where it's been stuck and unable for Iran to use it. Keep in mind that the Iranian government is under enormous <coughs> pressure from its population to improve the economic conditions yesterday. So the idea that they're gonna somehow use the entire $150 billion to give it off to Hezbollah certainly doesn't take that into account given that the Iranian government, while it's not the kind of democratic process that we claim to have in this country, despite the reality of what we have, uh, it, it is a government that is accountable to its population and has to be. So it has to satisfy people's needs. So all of those things are, are crucial, but I think the, the key point is that this is exactly what everybody should be working on right now. And also one thing I forgot that um, Ami Ayala and the Shin, former Shin Bet head and there are Israeli intelligence and military officials that are supporting right. the deal. There's a, it's not Israeli military that officials. Street is and, right, there's back. plenty of that. I don't think the only argument that can be used is about Israel. It is important because that is uh, they are the ones that are funding this, this huge campaign against it. But there are also claims about what it means for the United States and our ability to be a negotiating partner with any country in the future if other countries start to look at us as a country that can't be relied on to implement what it says. You know, when your president signs an agreement and the, pres and the, the Congress then goes and says, you know what, We're, we don't like it, we're gonna demand that it be renegotiated that doesn't strengthen the United States. So that's an argument as well. I think, Nedfa, uh, you want to say something? Uh, yes, it's just about the, this is the end of the program, right? And so this is the, just, it's, it's a log logistical thing. So there are no more books at the bookstore. Okay. And so. <laughs> wait, 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 so, don't panic, don't panic. <laughs> but we have but. more. And, and the but is that you can, that you, have, you can buy them right here at the table but we can only accept cash or a check made out to the Institute for Policy Studies, no credit cards. And so that's... Checks, actually, checks to that's a great interlink. Sign. Yeah. All right. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Checks, no, no, Phyllis will say. Checks to interlink. It's the publisher. Interlink, one word. Interlink. Or cash. Uh, there's a gentleman that's had his hands for a long time. I, I, I apologize, you didn't get a chance to say something. Do you want to say something quick, please? Okay. Yes. Very succinct. As a writer, the agenda poser, uh, Phyllis, do you have an opinion on uh, Flint Leverett's concrete proposal? He, a former CIA analyst, member of National Security Council, and Penn State professor, namely paradigm shift in US foreign policy, distancing itself from the problem states of Saudi Arabia and Israel, engaging uh, Turkey and Iran, 
uh, Sunni and uh, Shiite moderates, and then attempting to diffuse and contain Daesh. That, like violence generates violence, this kind of Sunni-Shiite uh, relationship between Turkey and Iran could be like a nucleating agent that would change the history of the Middle East. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, discussion of that, and I think that there has been significant um, ties being built between Turkey and Iran until about the last two years. Uh, and that did have the capacity to really rework the, the um, relationships in the region. My only hesitation on that, on the proposal, is the, the degree to which it puts the United States at center stage. And I, I recognize why that may be necessary in the immediate period, but it's something I would think, I would hope that we would uh, be a bit more modest in our, what we call for to, if Iran and Turkey are able to have that kind of intersection, that would be very positive. If the U.S. could stand back a little bit, that would be even better. All right, thank you, Phyllis Benes. Great talk. We're going to do this, thank you, we're going to do this uh, in an orderly fashion, if you don't mind, if the line can form down this way, and Phyllis will be here at the edge of the stage to sign the book, so please form the line this way and go that way. Thank you.